Good afternoon. I'd like to talk to you about how to grow your business. And to me, the key to growing your business in a tough market like this one is there's one key, and that's to turn your customers into believers. So what we're going to look at this afternoon is what is a believer, why would you worry about turning a customer into a believer, and most importantly, how do you turn customers into believers? Ask yourself, what's the difference between a customer and a believer? For me, a customer is somebody who is interested in the transaction. A believer is somebody who is interested in maintaining a relationship. Now, I know that you're interested in maintaining a relationship, but that doesn't matter, does it? The question is, is your client interested in maintaining the relationship? The difference between a customer and a believer is that a customer might do business with you because you, well, you just happen to be there. And that's fine, and you looked like a good deal at the time, but it really, if you disappeared, their world would hardly come to an end. But a believer is somebody who is not just making an intellectual decision, thinking, gosh, I might buy from that person, but there's somebody who's got an emotional attachment. You've connected not just with the mind, but with the heart, and they truly would feel it were you to go somewhere else. I mean, what I've learned in 35 years of being in business is that one of the things to aim for is to create a situation where if your customers didn't do business with you, they would feel like they were missing out on something. And I travel a lot internationally and, and around this part of the world where I can, I travel with Air New Zealand. And a couple of years ago, I was uh, flying, doing a major trip which, to Australia, which involved going across the Tasman two or three times and then doing some internal travel in Australia. And I'm booking this all online and I got to the stage where now I would have to use someone else in Australia because Air New Zealand didn't fly between Adelaide and, and Darwin. And my heart sank. I mean, it wasn't just thinking, oh darn, I've got to use another carrier. I just had this emotional reaction, you know, was some, that, that feeling in your stomach, and you think, oh, this is just not good. And then I started to think about times when my wife and I lived in Canada, and we used to come back to New Zealand to see her family, and that feeling you got when you flew from the north of Canada to Los Angeles, went into the airport, and there you saw the Air New Zealand plane. And you know, and that's the stage where I realized that they had created something that was turning me from a customer into a believer. Think about it yourself. How many people do you do business with where you are simply a customer? You're happy? Fine. But if they went somewhere else, not the end of the world. I have a Caltech star card. I live on the North Shore. There was a Caltech station a few blocks from where I live, and they closed down. And my only reaction was, oh, that's a bit of a nuisance. You know, but really, who cares? On the other hand, you can probably think of people that you would really feel it where they went somewhere else. Now, the point is this. When you have a hot prospect, when you have an appointment made and you're on your way to see this hot prospect, do you think to yourself, gosh, I really hope I turn this person into a client? Do you think that's my aim? You know, my aim is to win this person over and do business with them. Or do you think to yourself, my aim is to turn that person into a believer? And what I'm saying to you is that if you want to grow your business in a tough market, then that's that second thing that you aim for. The bar is higher, you will work harder, but the rewards are much greater. So let's have a look at why you would want to turn a customer into a believer. And the answer to that is to look at how you grow a business. And in 35 years, I've only found three ways to grow a business. And if you can think of a fourth one, well, come and tell me at the end of today's session. I'd love to hear about it. But I think the first way you grow a business is to acquire new customers. You know that. I'm sure you put a lot of time and effort and thought into trying to acquire new customers. It's how you it's the obvious way to grow a business. The second is to sell more to existing 
customers. And the third is to keep existing customers for longer. Now, I don't know any other way of growing a business. You know, cost cutting, cost management. Yeah, they're important parts of running a business, but you don't sustainably grow a business that way. You might make an improvement in your bottom line in the short term, but to have a sustainable growth in a business, you need to do one of these three things. And if you look at it, that's really the process of business, isn't it? You acquire a customer, you sell something to them, and we all know you should aim to hang on to that customer. But I think the thing we need to look at here is the order in which you should practice these three things in terms of trying to grow your business in a tough market. And the order is actually the reverse from what you see on the board. That your number one strategy should be to keep your existing customers for a longer period of time. Now you might think, well hang on, how do you grow a business simply by keeping customers for a longer period of time. I mean, doesn't that just maintain the, the status quo, you might think? Well, ask yourself this. Do you ever lose any customers? And if you do, what does that cost you? Well, this morning I asked that to a smaller audience and somebody said, well, I guess, you know, could lose two a year. I said, yeah, what's that worth to you? And he said, well, you know, it could be worth $500 a year. Okay, so we've got a customer, he's worth $500, we lose him this year, how much have we lost? Well, 500 this year, and then there's the 500 we might have had next year, and the 500 we might have had the year after that. So now we have to start thinking about, well, what is the lifetime of a customer? Well, in your business, I would suggest that you start thinking lifetime being minimum 20 years, and even longer, I mean, I can tell you that it was just yesterday that I took out term life, income protection, disability, but my advisor would tell you it was 30 years ago. And I'm not done yet. So lifetime of a customer in your business could be a very, very long time. Well, let's be conservative in our analysis here and say that it might only be 20 years. So this customer who's worth $500 to us a year, over 10 years is worth $5,000 and over 20 years is worth $10,000. And we got two of them that we're losing, so really we're losing $20,000 a year just because customers are moving on somewhere else. What if you could wave a magic wand and cut that in half and a churn for this guy was not two a year, it was only one a year. Right away he's growing his business by $10,000 a year and he doesn't have to spend any serious money to do that. He doesn't have to compete with others, he doesn't have to go out there and justify his product uh, and the pricing of his product compared to, to other people. He's just simply got to look after the customers that he's got. The basic rule here is that the best customer, your best customer, is the one in front of you right now. The concept here is called lifetime value. That's what this figure represents. This is the lifetime value of this particular customer in this situation here. Now, I run a number of businesses. I've been on the board of businesses. I used to be on the board of Caledonian when it existed. I've been chairman of a small financial planning company, as well as in the automotive confectionery industries. I can tell you, any business that I'm involved in, I make it very clear to people, the number one rule is I want 100% of the lifetime value. Well, why would I settle for any less? You know, we've worked really hard and got that customer. We've convinced that customer that we're the people who can provide the product or service. They like us. We've got them in our system. We should be looking after them. Why would I expect anything less than 100%? Why do I want to hear 10 years down the track, they've gone and done business with somebody else? Why did we squander that? And that's the way we've got to be thinking. And that we've got this asset and we need to look after this asset, and that is our number one priority. There is a change taking place in your industry that adds even more urgency to this. In the last month, I have had three conversations with three different insurers who have made the point 
that they're finally starting to realize that there is no profit in doing business with advisors who have poor persistency rates. And so now they're beginning to say, you know what? Maybe we don't want to do business with these people. So if you can't demonstrate that this is your number one priority and you are successful at it, you might find the game has changed. We all know what the industry has been like and probably still is today. You know, insurers would just love to have you push their products. But now they're starting to say, well, I don't know. And if this is to the point that in one case, one insurer I talked to decided that is thinking seriously that this year's road show, instead of let's invite everybody and try and convince them to sell our products and services, that this year's road show will be by invitation only and it will be to make this point. And why is it by invitation only? Because a guy said to me, you know, I think we've got 10 or 15 percent of advisors who are never going to make it. They're not going to get this. They're never going to get their standards up. I'm not even going to invite them. I'm not even going to invite them to tell them that I'm not going to do business with them anymore. <laughs> now, who knows whether that will happen this year or next year, but I'll tell you, I reckon it's going to happen. And that's just one more reason, and it's a great thing really for us if it encourages us to follow the, this number one rule, the best way to grow your business is to keep your existing customers for longer. Once we've done that, once we have secured our customers, then we want to move into the second one, which is to sell more to existing customers. By the way, the advantage of turning a customer into a believer is that believers are loyal. Because they have that emotional attachment, they will not want to go somewhere else. Because they know they would feel a sense of loss if they did, they will want to stay with you. The second thing we want to do is to sell more to existing customers. Again, this is why we want to turn a customer into a believer. Because believers not only buy, believers will buy anything you've got to sell that is relevant to them. They will buy as much as they possibly can because they trust you, they believe in you and what you say, and if you can show them that this seems to be a smart thing for them to have, then they will look for a way to get it, not, well, do I want it or not, but how can I possibly purchase this? I have three sons, grown-up sons, who now live in, grew up in New Zealand, but now live in Canada and travel in the States because they are three quarters of a rock band and they travel the states opening for very, very big bands. They have something like uh, just under 18,000 fans on Facebook. This year I've learned the power of turning a customer into a believer. One of the ways they make a little extra money is when they're on tour, then the head of their fan club organizes private gigs for them, maybe acoustic shows. And one of these was organized last year with a couple who run a gymnasium in Chicago. This is for teaching kids gymnastics. And they hired the band to come and do an acoustic show for the kids who, uh, who belong to the gym, you see. Now I know about this because it was videoed and I got a copy of the DVD. So I'd never met this person who organized it, but I knew what he and his wife looked like. Well, I went across to the States earlier this year to watch the boys on tour, and I was watching them play in uh, Las Vegas in the House of Blues, and as I was entering into the uh, theater, I see this guy in the line, and I recognize him from the DVD, see? So I went up, and I introduced myself, and we got chatting, and I said to him, look, mate, you know, why, are you, why have you flown from Chicago to Las Vegas to watch the guys play? They're going to Chicago next week, and they're doing two nights, two shows. He said, yeah, we know, we're going to both of them. And then he said, the night after that, they've got off, so we've hired them to come and do another acoustic show at the gym. And he said, that afternoon, I've organized for them to come to the Chicago Cubs baseball game. And he said, I've got seats for them right behind home plate. And he said, I used to work there, and so I've organized for them to actually go on the field before the game, which is really sacred turf. And then do you know what he said to me? Just a minute later, he said, gosh, I feel really badly that we're not doing more for the guys. This is how believers think. And that's what you want. Customers out there who are thinking they would like to do something to help you. And instead of it being you thinking, gosh, I should ask for a referral, but I'm kind of nervous to do that because I often get a rejection or I get, oh, I don't know, mate, you know. You've got people who are saying, hey, listen, I've really enjoyed this experience. 
could, could, you couldn't go and see my brother, could you? Or I was talking to my mate about you the other day, and he said he was interested. I've got his card. Would you have time to go and see him? <laughs> That's how the game changes when you start turning a customer into a believer. This is really incredible thing to be doing because here we've got the concept of lifetime value and here we've got the concept of share of wallet. We have uh, customers who spend money on products and services that we can or could provide. The question you want to ask yourself is how much are they spending with other people that they could be spending with you? The total amount that they spend on wealth creation and, and risk protection products is the wallet, the size of the wallet. What you want to know is what share do you have? Now I have a very nice advisor that I've dealt with for some 30 years. In fact, it's just come to an end because he's finally retired. Um, he probably thinks he knows what my business is, but he doesn't because I have one or two um, life products that I've secured elsewhere. You know, I have a life product from Asteron that I dealt with directly with him. So he doesn't have 100% of my wallet, and he doesn't even know that he doesn't have 100% of my wallet, so it probably doesn't bother him, but it should because I've been doing this business with Asteron for probably over 10 years, and that's a fair chunk of money that he could have had, but he never had because it never occurred to him to ask about, to think about, or to look at how could he sell more to me. So the question for you is, for your top customers, what is the size of their wallet, and how much of it do you have, and why don't you have all of it? And again, with those businesses in which I'm involved, I'm saying to people, not only do I want their lifetime value, 100% of it, I want 100% of their share of wallet. We know them, we've engaged with them, we spend time and effort with them. Why do I want them spending money with somebody else? What have we got to do to get all of their business? That's the question you should be asking yourself. I don't think we're very good at this. Maybe you are, so please don't be offended. But my experience um, as a company director, as an employer, as a consultant, is that we're not very good at this, generally speaking, and I think there are two reasons. One of them, well, you know, I once had the opportunity to speak to a Million Dollar Roundtable in, uh, in America, their national conference. It was in New Orleans quite a few years ago now. 7,000 people there for the week, and you can, if you've ever been, I mean, it's just a magnificent uh, conference of really high-powered people, high-energy, top-quality stuff. But as I sat through the conference, because I sat there every day for five days and participated as well as spoke, I thought, hang on a minute, there's a hidden agenda here. And that hidden agenda was these jokers were convincing themselves that selling life insurance was okay. And I thought, well, that's pretty weird, because number one, they're the top 1%, right? I mean, you know, to be an MDRT, you've got to qualify every year. You've got to be right up there. So these people coming along are cream of the crop. So why would they have any kind of doubt or crisis of confidence? And secondly, as you well know, life insurance, particularly term life, truly is a miracle product. I mean, there aren't many things you buy in life where at some point in time somebody is guaranteed to get back a lot more than was ever put in in purchasing it. I mean, if you're really lucky when you buy life insurance, you die the next day because then the premium input was pretty low. But if you're, even if you're very unlucky and you have a long and healthy life, somebody at the end is going to get a fair bit of money more than was ever put in. So why would these guys have a crisis of confidence? I began to realize that they had the wrong view of selling. Even these people, cream of the crop, had the wrong view of selling. And then ever since then, I've started to realize that maybe most of us have the wrong view of selling. That what we think is that selling is trying to persuade somebody to do something that they don't want to do. And to do that, well, you got to be a bit pushy. And hey, that's not how we see ourselves. You know, as Kiwis, we don't see ourselves as pushy or aggressive. Most of us live in small towns. I mean, even Auckland is just a collection of, of small towns. And you are likely to go to the to the, to the park on the weekend, you know, the sports field, because you want to watch your kid play, 
And what you don't want to do is be pushy during the week because on Saturday morning you don't want to be standing on the sidelines looking across the paddock, seeing the guy that you talk to during the week, nudge his partner, point across and say, that's the bastard, tried to sell me the fries with that, you know? <laughs> so we just pull, pull in a bit. The other reason that we're not very good at it is because uh, we, we um, don't follow the right process. So let's talk about, is that the right view of selling? I mean, is selling persuading somebody to do something that they don't want to do? No, you know that. I mean, what is selling? Selling is really, if you follow the process, identify needs. As a clinical psychologist, I can tell you that if you've got a need that's not met, you've got a problem. So really, what we're trying to do is identify problems that our customers have or in your industry particularly, could have down the track were they not protected, and then show them that there are solutions available, and demonstrate to them the cost and the benefits of each of those solutions, and then we let them make up their mind. So selling is not persuading people to do something they don't want to do. It is giving people the opportunity to buy problems, uh, buy solutions to problems that bother them or that they could have and that would bother them were they to occur. So we don't have to be pushy to do the on-sell and the upsell, but what we do need to do is to follow a process that reflects that understanding. And that process, of course, all begins with the problem. I'm customer care advisor to six retail brands in Australia, two of them are in New Zealand, but one of them, which is just in Australia, is called Sanity Entertainment, and they sell CDs and DVDs, that sort of stuff. CEO said to me last year, he said, look, mate, as you're traveling around, could you mystery shop some of our stores and give me some feedback? Now, every month they have an on-sale product, and this month it happened to be, well, I don't know if you know this, but over time, your CD player gets a lot of gunk inside, and that floats around, and that interferes with the quality of the laser beam, which then, in turn, affects the quality of the sound that you're getting out of it, you see? So somebody created a CD, it must have an electromagnetic field that it creates that sucks all that stuff in, and, and you bang it in there, play it, and it cleans up the inside, and you're a lot better off. So that month, that was their upsell or on sell, and I think it was $5 or $7. So the first store I went into, I bought a CD and I'm paying for it, and we get right to the end, I'm just about to leave, and the guy said to me, uh, oh, did I talk to you about one of these? Holding up this CD, and I said, no, you didn't, and that was the end of that conversation. The second store I went into, again, I got right to the end of the sales process, and the guy said to me, oh, you don't want one of these, do you? I said, no, you're right about that. <laughs> And the third store I got into, as we started going through the sales process of, you know, wrapping it up, taking the money, all that stuff, the woman said to me, do you know that over time the inside of your CD player gunks up? And I said, no, I didn't know that, but when you think about it, it makes sense. She said, yes, yeah, so all that stuff floats around and it interferes with the laser beam and that affects the quality of the sound. And I thought, well, that makes sense. So she said picking up the CD I was just buying, before you play this brand new CD, for seven bucks, would you like to clean the inside of your CD player so that the sound you get is really good? Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. But what was the difference between that last one and the other two? Well, the first two were product floggers. The last one went through the process of let's identify the problem, Make me aware of that problem, see the consequence of that problem, and demonstrate the solution and explain very quickly the cost-benefit, and then I made my mind up. And that's what we should be doing. And in fact, if you look at the regulations and the whole pressure about co compliance, isn't that what legislation is now requiring you to do? And isn't that an indictment on our industry that some fool in Wellington had to pass a law to tell us how to do business in the way that we should? And if you do business in that way, will your customers think, gosh, what a pushy son of a gun? Or will your customer think, gosh, thank you very much for at least giving me the opportunity to say yes or no about that particular solution to the problem? And in fact, take it one step further. If you do not do that, and your customer finds out six months later that they have a problem, that they could have protected themselves against or avoided had you bothered to take the time to discuss it with them, 
was that customer going to say, boy, am I ever glad that he or she was not pushy? Or are they going to say, well, I've been cheated. You know, I've been deprived. That, that was a disservice. That this person damn well knew that this problem could occur. I mean, that's their profession. They knew that Asteroid had a solution to it, and they never showed it to me. Never gave me the chance to say, yes, no, I don't want it. So for any number of reasons, we should be making this our second growth strategy. We should understand the share of the size of wallet, understand our share of wallet, and we should be working to get the maximum purchase, not just to our advantage, but to make sure that our customers are given opportunities to understand problems they have or could have, to see there are solutions, and to make a decision about whether or not they want to take advantage of those solutions. Then, and only then, when we've maximized these two things, in my view, should we turn our attention to this. But you know what? What you're going to find is that by the time you turn your attention to this, you don't need to turn your attention to this, because other people have done it for you. Believers are not just loyal. They won't just buy everything that you've got available if it's relevant to them. They will tell others how fantastic you are. Believers are evangelists. And they will spread the word of mouth. And you know that word of mouth is the most powerful prospecting tool there is. And how much nicer that you don't have to ask somebody, mate, have you got some friends I could go and see? But at the end of it, he or she says, look, Really appreciate what you've done. In fact, I hope you don't mind, but I've passed your name on to a few other people. They'll probably give you a call, and you can say, well, that's great. They'll look, if you tell giving their numbers, I'll call them. Just save them making the phone call. You may not know. You may know that word of mouth is important. I'm sure you do. You may not know how important it is. London School of Economics did some research a few years ago. They found that businesses that have a lot of people saying positive things about them and very few people saying negative things grew four times more quickly. Four times! Not 33% more, 50% more, four times more quickly simply because of that word of mouth. In New Zealand, research by Colmar Brunton shows that if people have a good experience, they will tell nine others, and 33% of the time they will recommend that that person does business where they just had the great experience. And research in New Zealand by Colmar Brunton shows that if people have a bad experience, they will tell 13 others, and 56% of the time they will recommend to people that they do not do business with that particular person or company. The thing is, you should know, every time you interact with an existing or potential client, the chances are very, very high that they are going to tell somebody else about that experience. My question to you is, what are you doing to make sure that they're telling a good story and that they're spreading a positive word of mouth that's going to generate more business with you because that's how you're going to bring in these new customers? You know how hard it is to get people's attention. You send them a flyer, they don't want to know about it. You put an ad in a newspaper, they don't read it. You ring them up and ask them if you can come and talk to them, and they say, well, not really, mate, but thanks for your call. Right? But who will they listen to? They'll listen to their brother, or their sister, or the person who lives next door, or their workmate, or somebody they, they play squash with. And that's the person that we have got to be impressing. So why would you want to turn a customer into a believer? Because they will be loyal, because they will buy everything you can, because they will be evangelists and tell others and do the hard prospecting work for you. How do you turn a customer into a believer? The key is to deliver an outstanding customer experience. It's not about the product. It's not about the service. It's about the experience. The product's got to be good, the service has got to be good, but I mean, that's what people expect today. What they want now is a great experience when they do business with you. Here are some things to think about. What experience do your customers want from you? All right, if you were to give me a list of very specific adjectives, not best, not good, not great, but if you were to define, to paint a picture of that experience, what would it be? Not what do you think 
it should be, what do you know your customers would say? And if you've got a hundred customers, you won't have just one idea of what makes a great experience. But you also won't have a hundred ideas of what makes a great experience. You may find that you have three or four. And what if we started to segment our customers based on not the demographics or their psychographics, but actually on the kind of experience they were looking for? So first of all, do you know what experience your customers are looking for? Secondly, do you have a plan to deliver that? Now most people that I deal with, even clients of mine who obviously buy into this stuff, do not have a plan for delivering a certain kind of experience. You don't have to start from nowhere. We know, for example, that in New Zealand, the three things that matter to people are number one, demonstrate a willingness to help. Number two, listen and understand my needs. Don't talk about your product and service. Listen and understand my needs. Next time you go out on an appointment, 10 minutes into it, listen to who's speaking. Is it you or is it them? And if it's you, you're not listening and understanding their needs, you're product flogging, telling them all about it, mate, how fantastic it is. And the third thing that they want is to see somebody take ownership for meeting those needs. Right? And somebody's saying, leave it with me. I'll sort it. You've come to the right place. I don't have the answer to that question, but I'll find out for you. I'll be back to you with that information tomorrow. Yep, okay, clearly the, what, what you're looking for doesn't 100% match the products that I've told you about that Astron has, but I'll talk to somebody tomorrow and I'll come back and see if something can be modified, something can be customized, whether they've got a product that I don't know about. Leave it with me, mate. I'll sort it for you. That's what customers want to hear. What they don't want to hear is a conversation I had on the telephone with somebody last year. I phoned them up and I asked them a question. They said, no, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that. No, I don't know who you could talk to. No, I haven't heard about that either. Oh, that's a new one to me. No, I'm sorry. No. Okay, anything else I can help you with? Did, did I miss something here? You know? I mean, that's not what they want. So you need to flesh that out. What are the pet hates of Kiwis? The things they hate are, number one, not being able to get hold of somebody that they need to talk to. And what they hate is people who won't take responsibility and who won't follow up. I phoned... I got an email from, I have a Mac, and I got an email from Apple telling me that there is a new software, a new level of software out. And I thought, oh, that's good, I should upgrade it in my machine. But then I found out that to do that, I need a level of software between the one new one that's coming out and the one I've got. Anyway, the end of the long story short, I finally talking to somebody at a call center in America, and, you know, can I get this product? And, oh, yes, you, you can, but there's a, you know, there's a three-week delay, and da-da-da-da-da. And I asked some questions. She said, I'll look into it and get back to you, and that's the last I've ever heard. It's the last I've ever heard, and it's the last I'm going to buy from them. You know, and, and I, I say to people, Apple Macs, love the computer, hate the company. You know, so I'm not a believer in the company. I am a believer in the product, but that means somebody comes out with a product that's as good, I'm gone <laughs> real fast. So we do need to understand what constitutes a great experience, and then you need to have a plan for delivering it. You wouldn't make a sales call without a plan for how you will present the, the, uh, the, the products that you've got. You wouldn't go prospecting without some kind of plan. You don't get up in the morning and make it up as you go along. Why would we do that with a customer experience? Here are some key steps to creating a great customer experience. The first is to be very, very clear about what business you are in. If somebody came up to you at a party and said, mate, what business are you in? What would you say? Well, would you say, well, I'm in insurance? Would you say I'm in risk? Would you say I'm in wealth creation? What? Well, I'll tell you what I would suggest you say. You say, you know what, mate? I'm in the customer business. Not, not the customer service. I'm in the customer business. And I say that because the only way I can succeed in business, you'd tell them, is if I attract customers, if I sell things to customers, if I keep customers. And in fact, if you look at this, 
How do you grow a business? Get new customers. Sell more to existing customers. Keep existing customers for longer. When you look at it that way, how could you be in any business other than the customer business? Well, you might find that the person would say to you, well, hang on, pal. Anybody who's in business could say that they're in the customer business. And you would say, well, they could and they bloody well should. Because if you're in business, the only way you succeed is to attract, make money from, and retain customers. Now, if I haven't convinced you, answer this question for me. What percentage of your profits come from your customers? <laughs> But how about 100%? And in fact, unless you're losing money or borrowing to expand, what percentage of your total revenue comes from your customers? 100%. doesn't come from the insurers. They just try and grab a piece of it as it goes by. It comes from the customer. How many of you have got people working for you who are not here today? Okay, well, here's some questions to ask them. Three questions, really. One, who pays your wages? And what's the answer? So, two, who do you work for? Well, I guess if the customer pays the wages, it's the customer they work for. Number three, who's the boss? Well, I guess if the customer's who you work for because they pay the wages, then they're the boss. And that's what we need to be thinking. And it's not just the money. It's our reason to exist. You know, I mean, if Jeff said to you, look, guys, I got some good news and some bad news. Bad news is we just lost all of our customers. You know, every single advisor who works with us, all their customers have gone and they're never coming back. The good news is I've been able to negotiate a deal with Astron to fund each and every one of you for the next three years. So money is not going to be the issue. Well, most of you would think all of your Christmases have come at once, right? Fantastic. I got no customers to have to worry about and the money's going to come in. Boy, we can reorganize the office. We can repaint it. We can do training. We can sort out our files. I can write a better brochure. Yeah, that'd be okay. Until about three weeks later, you'd think, you know, I'm not sure why I'm doing this because nobody's ever going to use it. Nobody's ever going to ring the office. Nobody's ever going to come into the office. Nobody's ever going to go into our database. I've got nobody to send the brochure to. You'd also think, well, that's great. You know, I've got some time now. We can spend time with each other, getting to know each other in the business because it's all too, too rushed and, and we're treating each other like, you know, cogs in a wheel instead of human beings. But that too would fade after about three weeks when you'd realize that the people who work with you are nice people, but they're not that interesting that you want to hear about it eight hours a day, five days a week. Your customers are the only reason you have to exist, at least in the work environment. So without customers, we have no money and we have no reason to exist. So therefore, why would we think that we are in any business other than the customer business? So we need to understand that the aim, if you are in that business, is to have profitable customers who stay with you for a long time. Is that forefront of your mind? Is that forefront of the mind of the people that you deal with? You see, it's becoming forefront of the mind of the insurers who are beginning to think it's actually not about the top line and about volume. It's about the bottom line and profitability. And maybe we're better off dealing with 10% fewer advisors and having a greater profitability because we're not losing money through unprofitable business. And if that's a good way for them to think, I'd suggest that's a good way for you to be thinking. You also need to understand what your job is. What is your job? Well, it's not to make a, to, to find prospects. It's not to arrange appointments. It's not even to make sales. Your job is to turn customers into believers. And that's what should be in the forefront of your mind. And when you sit down on a Friday night and have a drink and have a think about how well your week has gone, don't think about how many new prospects did I find? How many presentations did I make? How many did I convert into sales? Think to yourself, did I increase the percentage of customers who are now believers? Because that's the only way you're going to grow your business sustainably. So the first key is to understand what business you're in, and it is clearly in the customer business. The second thing is to understand what business your customers are in, so that you can sell what your customers are buying. What business do you think your customer's in? What are they buying? Well, clearly they're not buying insurance products. 
I mean, I can tell you, as somebody who has been a customer of your industry for many decades, that there's nobody who wants a policy. And I got a binder full of the damn things, you know? And I get these updates and whatever, codices. I don't want them. I don't want to know anything. What I want is what those policies will do for me and what I think those policies will do for me and what those policies will actually do for me should I be in adverse circumstances. So what I want is the ability to, to protect myself from things that might go wrong. The, and why do I want to protect myself? So that I can recover quickly. That if my car is stolen, I can be back, or crashed, I can be back on the road in a similar vehicle in a short period of time. That if an earthquake damages my house, if it burns down, if I'm sick, that I can fairly soon see that I'm going to be back where I am today with the lifestyle I've got, with the income that I've got. That's what people want. And that's what they want in the future. So what they want right now is peace of mind that that's going to happen. And this is an industry that used to understand that. This is an industry that knew that what it was selling to its customers was peace of mind. But that's gone. Because I hear people in your industry say to me, you know, it's just a grudge purchase. People don't want insurance. It's just a grudge purchase. They know they've got to get it. And I say, mate, well, then you're not selling what your customers are buying. IAG, I did some work with IAG many years ago. Um, and when their CEO was a fellow who'd moved in from the banking industry, so he wasn't so precious about, uh, about insurance. And that was the time, you may have seen it, they had an ad that said, we pay 98% of all claims. Do you remember that ad on TV? And I said to him, said, David, that's the dumbest ad I've ever seen. He said, why? And I said, because if I saw that ad, first thing I'd think about is, why didn't you pay the other 2%? And the second thing I'd think about is, yeah, you paid my claim, but boy, did we have to fight over it. Did I have to push you? And the third thing I'd think is, I haven't had a claim in 10 years. Boy, am I ever being ripped off. He said, all right, smart guy, so what would your ad be? I said, you know what, I'd have two guys sitting at a bar. One says to the other, mate, when's the last time you worried about what would happen if your car was stolen? He says, I never think about it. And I'd say, well, there you go. That's 60 bucks a month you pay him is worth it, isn't it? Right? Because every day you're getting peace of mind. And then you'd be thinking, yeah, yeah. Boy, I haven't thought about that all, all week. So it was worth paying that money not to have to worry about that. I can watch what happens in Christchurch on TV and see terrible things happen to people's houses and not worry about what would happen if my house was burnt down or if a flood or a slip took it out because I've got comprehensive insurance to cover that, replacement insurance. So our customers are buying peace of mind today. They're buying protection should adverse things happen in the future. And that all is about maintaining their standard of living, their quality of life. Is that where we start the conversation? Or do we start the conversation in our world of products, insurance products and, and services. I can tell you what a difference it makes when somebody sells what you're buying. If you're selling to a business person, I can tell you that what they are buying is the ability to maintain their income in adverse situations. If you're selling to a private consumer, they're buying the ability to restore their standard of living or their quality of life should something uh, horrible happen to them. That's how we should open it. I was chairman of a confectionery business, as I mentioned to you, and I was in a store in Rotorua one day with the managing director, one of our stores. He, we made handmade chocolates, real chocolate, you know, high quality premium stuff. He said, I think, um, I think about putting a fudge machine in each store because it's a similar compatible product, high quality, high value, extend the range, more revenue, blah, blah, blah. I said, yeah, mate, that makes a great deal of sense. So, but where are you going to put a fudge machine? I mean, these stores aren't that big. He said, oh, it would fit on a table about this size. I said, yeah, well, cool. That's okay. That could be handy. So how much is this going to cost anyway? He said it's going to cost $16,000 per machine. I said, what are you smoking that I should be smoking? You know, $16,000? Something that fits on a table? You're crazy. He said, look, let's meet with the salesman anyway. All right, so we organized that three me weeks later in Rotorua, where are you going to have your conference? Where we'd have a meeting with the salesman. And we met in this grubby restaurant down by the waterfront, which is, I think, pretty grubby most of the time down there. And the only thing grubbier than the restaurant and the waterfront was the salesman. I mean, he looked like he'd been dragged through a gorse bush backwards. He had an old scuffed 
book under his arm that had those plastic sleeves with stuff in it, you know. And the first words to me was not to introduce himself. He said, oh, let's get a cheese sandwich and a coffee and sit down. So I'm thinking, I'm here for as short a period of time as I have to be. I'm not impressed. So we grab the coffee and we sit down and he says to me, would you like to increase the revenue in your store by 33%? I said, I'll bite. He said, right, this is what you do. And he opened his book and he said, you get a cabinet that looks like this. Not like that, not like that. It's got to look like this and this is why. He said, draw me a floor plan of the store. I did. He said, you put that cabinet there. You don't put it here. You don't put it here. It's got to go there. This is why. That's how he talked for an hour and a half. Never talked about the price, never talked about the fudge machine, never talked about the ingredients, the system, the deal. He talked about how I could use that machine to increase the revenue in a store by 33%. And at the end, we bought it for all of our stores, and we increased our revenue by 33% and more. Now, if he had opened with any line other than that, I was out of there. I was not convinced if he'd started telling me about this wonderful machine and equipment and whatever, I'd have been looking for an excuse to say, look, I'm sorry, mate, but I, I didn't realize I've got another appointment, you know. There's a sick dog somewhere and I need to go and nurture the owner. I mean, just, but as soon as he looked me in the eye and he said, would you like to increase your revenue by 33%? I didn't believe him, but I had an obligation to listen. You know, I can hardly go to the next board meeting and say, oh, I had an interesting experience the other day. Some guy wanted to help us increase our revenue by 33%, but I told him to piss off. You know, I mean, that wouldn't keep me on the board very long, would it? Never mind as chairman. It, so that's how we should start. I can show you how to maintain your income even under adverse circumstances. And how easy is that conversation to start today when we live in a world where the unimaginable happens daily? You know, this year I have had work disrupted because of ash clouds from Chile, because of uh, earthquakes in Christchurch, and snow all over New Zealand, and it isn't even the end of August yet. Right? In that kind of world, how hard is it to say to somebody, in the words of Forrest Gump, shit happens, mate. When it does, what would the effect be on your business, on your life? I can help you protect yourself against that. So we need to understand the business we're in. We need to understand the business our customers are in. That may seem obvious to you, but I can tell you that there's a lot of research where people say the people I do business with do not understand me or my business. And in fact, I have a personal banker with a bank that I deal with in New Zealand, and that bank did uh, phone me up because they were doing a survey for each personal banker, an interview over the phone to get feedback about how the bankers, personal bankers were behaving as, and how they were doing as the customers saw it. And one of the questions the person asked me is, how well does this banker understand your businesses? And I said, my banker understands my businesses extremely well, only because I invite him for coffee every month. If I left it to him, he'd know diddly squat about any of them. But because I'm prepared to shout the coffee every second month, he knows exactly where we are and where we're going and what our needs will be and what our cash flow situation is, but it's no thanks to him. He's a hell of a nice guy, but it's no thanks to him. So would, how many of your customers would say about you that you really understand their business? And I'm not talking business just in the commercial sense, but they un you understand what kind of lifestyle they want and what fears they have. and what things could happen and what they would want to see happen should those terrible things happen. And they think, yeah, I do business with that person because they really understand my world. It's not just something glib like understand my needs. They really understand my world. The third most important thing to do to create an outstanding customer experience is to make your customers successful. Now let's be really clear about this. We do not want to deliver great customer service. I don't know if you know, but we live in a world where customers are outraged. University of Waikato, University of New South Wales, University of Queensland have all done research, are all doing research, that show that customers are outraged. The University of Queensland has been doing it for eight years, and they show that over that period of time, customer rage is on the increase. Colmar Brunton has done research in New Zealand, and when you say to people, when you have a bad experience, 
What goes through your mind? People say things like, well, it makes you see red and you just want to get back at them. You have Kiwis say, well, you can understand how people become violent. Huh? This is how we react. Maybe you have had an experience that's enraged you. When Colmar Brenton went to people and said, on a scale of 1 to 10, how would you rate your rage in those situations? 26% of people rated it 8, 9, or 10, where 10 is the highest. Another 26 rated it 5, 6, or 7. So here's more than 50% of Kiwis saying, when I am enraged in a commercial situation, I'm experiencing rage in the top half of this scale. What's the consequence of that? 85% of New Zealanders say, when I have a bad experience, I ditch, ditch the company or the person. They also say, in 45% of the cases, they say, you know what? I don't think the company knows that I've ditched them. So they're blissfully going along, thinking, oh, this is great. Oh, I've got a customer base of 500,000. No, you haven't, mate. You lost 100,000 of them. You just don't know it. They also say, I'll give them one, maybe two chances. That's what you've got. Right? Tolerance is gone. And why is it like that? It's about this time, you know, somebody says to me, Brooksy, do you think the problem is that customers' expectations keep going up? And I laugh, but I say, you know, in 1970, I studied at the University of Stockholm in Sweden. I was only six at the time. But the Swedish government had a policy, because the Swedish government knew that in 1971, its citizens would expect more from its government and its agencies than it did in 1970. So the policy was that every government department and agency had to have a plan, be developing a plan in 1970 to deliver more in 1971 than they were in 1970. So a few minutes ago, I said, you need a plan to deliver to your customers today the kind of experience that they are looking for. Well, that's actually basic stuff. What we should be having is working on a plan so that next year we can deliver a better experience because we know that they will want a better experience. And we don't do that. And how do I know we don't do that? Because American Express just released a few months ago a study they did, the results of a study they did last year in 10 countries of the world, 10 Western countries, not all English speaking, and the results overwhelmingly found that customers said, I expect more from the businesses I deal with this year than last year, and I don't believe I'm getting it. And many said, we're getting less. So 81% of people, 81% said, I'm either getting no more or I'm getting less than I was getting last year, and I'm expecting more. And that gap is widening, and the rage is increasing, and isn't that great news for you? Because if you do the things that we've been talking about, then your customers are going to think, you know, that lady's not just better than anybody else. She's different. They really are very different from anybody else I do business with, and you're well on your way to turn them into a believer and a fan and an evangelist working on your behalf, which is exactly what we want. So we don't want to think about customer service because that's the concept that got us into this mess. I mean, it's just a pathetic one, really. I don't know if you've noticed, but Air New Zealand over the last few months has reinvented its trans-Tasman service to be like Jetstars, basically. And so when you go on the web to book a seat, um, you, get to buy, you can buy a seat, or you can buy a seat on an airplane, or you can buy a seat plus a bag. I mean, you've got this wide range of options, and you only get what you pay for. Well, the other day I went to Sydney just for the day, and so all I needed was a seat. You know, I don't have any luggage. And uh, I was the first flight over and the last flight back, and I was pretty buggered by the end of it, you know. And uh, so I went in the Corridor Lounge and I ate, and I had some alcohol because I knew that wasn't going to be offered on the plane. But uh, when it got to the time when they came serving, when the food trolley went by, and I said, you know, that's fine, I don't expect anything. The alcohol trolley went by, that's cool. But then the lady comes up with the tea, coffee, and water, and other stuff. She said, what would you like to drink, sir? I said, I'd just love a tonic water, please. She said, well, you can't have a tonic water. <laughs> Not, you can have one, but it cost you two bucks, mate. You can't have one, because you only bought a seat. Oh, bugger off, you know, get out of my life. So she goes, five minutes later, not even, because I'm gold elite, the in-flight service director comes up, oh, Dr. Brooks, is it? Oh, lovely to see you. Have a copy of the Herald. And I just laughed at him. I laughed and I laughed and I laughed. He said, well, sir, what's wrong? He said, man, I don't want a copy of the Herald at $1.50. I'd like a tonic water at $1.50. 
So I'm not asking you to spend any more money than you're prepared to spend. I'm asking you to give me what I'd like, not what you think I'd like. And that's Dave's point. That we should all be going out there and finding out what our customers want and looking at how we can give it to them instead of making that assumption and then trying to push it at them. So that's the trouble with service. Service is what I do for you. What I do for you doesn't matter. What matters is what you need me to do, what you want me to do. What really matters is how you feel after I've done it. So you're probably thinking, okay, so if we don't think about customer service, we should think about satisfying our customers because if we aim to satisfy our customers, we'll be thinking about how they feel. And that's better than service, but it's not good enough. You see, we want, as I said, profitable customers who stay with us for a long time. And I'm here to tell you that satisfied customers are not loyal customers. Believers are, but satisfied customers aren't. Research shows, depending upon the study, that up to 86% of customers who defect were satisfied at the time they defected. That's pretty scary. Also, doesn't make sense, eh? I mean, why would a satisfied customer switch, go somewhere else? I don't know. So anyway, you'll probably go home and somebody tonight will say, so how was your day? And you'll say, well, I was pretty good. I went to a seminar with TNP in the afternoon and the first two speakers were pretty good. The last guy was useless. But, <laughs> um, and they'll say, oh, yes, yeah, so where was it? And you'll say, oh, I was at the, uh, the Ellerslie uh, Convention Center, you know, the race course. And they'll say, oh, I've never been there. What, what, what are their conference rooms like? How many of you will say, brilliant? Absolutely. Do you know that they had chairs for us to sit on? <laughs> and not only that, they had carpet on the floor. And there were lights in the ceiling that worked. You wouldn't dream of saying that. Imagine those three things weren't here. You'd go home and slam the door. What's the matter with you? I'll tell you what's the matter. I had a seminar this afternoon. I had to stand up the whole damn time on a concrete floor. And there were no lights in the room. See, when you give your customers the things that satisfy with them, them, you're just giving them what they expect. And when they get what they expect, they're hardly noticing it. You know, that's not enough to turn them into believers, and our aim is to turn them into believers. So if you're not going to aim to service them or satisfy them, what are you going to do? You're going to aim to make them successful. What you want are people who sit back on a Friday night and they knock the top off a beer or they pour themselves a wine and they think, you know... I've got a pretty good business here, I've got a great lifestyle, and I don't worry about what could happen if things go wrong, and I know that if or when something went wrong, I was actually right back to where I was before, thanks to those protection products. I feel really optimistic about my future because of the wealth creation products that my advisor has introduced to me. When you get people thinking like that, they think you're a key part of their success, and they're a believer and they're loyal, and they're an evangelist, and that's what we need to aim to do. And it's not just the big picture like that, it's on small things. If you have people who work for you and they're not here, talk to them about this. Because when somebody rings up, you don't want the person in your office just responding to the need. Hello, how can I help you? Yeah, it's Ian Brooks here. Look, could, you know, I've lost a copy of the uh, policy document, and I, uh, could you send me another one? Sure, no problem. Yeah, we've got that on file. I'll send it out. You don't want them doing that. You want them saying, yeah, sure, we could do that, uh, Dr. Brooks, but may I ask you why you need that? Yeah, my, my bank wants such and such. Oh, well, look, Dr. Brooks, if, if that's what you want, actually, this policy document won't do it. What the bank wants is such and such and such and such. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, so we'll send that out to you. Would you like us to send it directly to your, to your banker? Or no, actually, I can't give you this. Um, but I can give you something else which will do the job just as well. So before we respond, and I mean, think about it for you. If somebody rang you up and said, uh, your name has been given to me by a relative. I need some uh, term life. I, I think Astron has got a great product. I'd really like you to come and talk to me about it. What would your response be? It'd be too right. I'll be right there. You'd be thinking to yourself, let's get this appointment in 24 hours before they change their mind. You know, let's get into it, baby. How many of you would think, you know what, the first thing I'm going to say is, let me ask you a silly question, sir. Why do you want a life product, from, a life product at all? And why were you thinking of one from Astron? Well, because such and such and such. Ah, look, happy to come and see you. But if that's what you're looking for, Astron has a much better product than that one. You know, it costs a little bit more, but the mate, 
it'll do exactly what you want. Right? Or maybe we leave that for the interview itself. But the point is, before we leap in, let's find out what our customers are trying to do. Because how could you make somebody successful if you don't know what they're trying to do? Most of us don't find out what people are trying to do. So it makes it very hard for us in a planned and deliberate way to make our customers successful. So we want to create an outstanding customer experience to turn customers into believers, because that's how we grow our business. We'll do that by creating this outstanding customer experience, as I say. And the steps to doing that are, number one, to understand we're in the customer business, to understand our customers' business, business and to sell what our customers are buying and to work to make our customers successful. Let's just talk about a couple more. One is steps. One is, the next one is put the customer first. Now, I don't need to convince you. You know that. You probably believe that. You probably intend to do that. And who am I to challenge that? But I would ask you to think about whether that really happens or whether it is just an intention. You see, what I've learned over the years are the two major obstacles to delivering the, often to delivering the kind of experience our customers are looking for are a company's or a business's policies and processes. And so you have people in the business who really believe the customer should come first. But in actual fact, the experience the customer has is of being second because of the policies and processes. I live on the North Shore here, and I went to the Mitre 10 Mega Store before Christmas, and uh, I wanted to buy some outdoor tree lights, not Christmas lights, you know, just white ones. And I saw they had two boxes on the shelf, and that's what I wanted, but I knew two weren't enough. And before I bought them, I said to... Uh, the guy who's there, I said, mate, two isn't enough. Are you going to have any more coming in? And he said, oh, look, I'll look in the computer. And he said, yeah, we will. He said, not before Christmas, but by the end of January, we should have them in. I said, that's cool. Not a problem. So I bought the two, and I went back at the end of January, and there were none there. And I thought, oh, gosh, they've come and gone. You know, I've missed it. So I said to some other bloke, I said, did I miss this? You know, they've come and gone. He said, no, well, I'll look in the computer. He said, no, gosh, they haven't come in yet. And I said, well, when are they going to come in? He said, I don't know. I said, well, I mean, that's not good enough. You know, I've been waiting six weeks. Now you tell me you don't know. Anyway, he said, tell you what. He said, look, look, I agree with you. Let's put in a special order for them. So he takes me over to the counter where there's a young woman there to take the special order, you know, and ask all the, answer all the questions that you do to make a special order, like, you know, how old was your grandmother when she lost her virginity, all that important stuff. So finally, we get to the end of it, and the woman said, that'll be a 50% deposit. I said, I don't think so. She said, well, that's our policy. And I said, well, that's a dumb policy. She said, well, that's our policy. And I said, well, I'd like to speak to the manager. So the manager comes up, what's the problem? I tell him, he said, that's our policy. I said, that's a dumb policy. He said, we have to have that policy. I said, do you just? Why is that? He said, well, you know, people come in and they make a special order for stuff. And then when the stuff arrives, they don't want it. And we have to sell it. I said, what a bastard. You're in retail and you got to sell stuff. How unfair is this, you know? I'm not asking you, mate. I said, I'm not asking you to bring in something you don't carry. I'm asking you to bring in something you're supposed to have already. And if the worst came to the worst and you had to sell it, well, that's what you're supposed to do, right? Anyway, I guess he understood the power of my logic or either that or the headlock had something to do with it. And he caved in and he waived that requirement. You see, so now we're friends. And I said, look, pal, I'm in business. And one of the things you got to decide is, you know, are you going to put the customer first or are you going to put yourself first? Quick as a flash, he said, well, obviously you put the customer first. I said, where have you been for the last half an hour? <laughs> you know, if you put the customer first, we wouldn't have been having this conversation. So, see, his heart's in the right place. But the way they've built their business with their policies and their processes, the customer comes off second rate. Would your customers feel, do your customers feel like that? Would your customers say that? Do you want to know the kicker to that story? After three months, I canceled the order because the stuff hadn't come in. Now, could you imagine if I had to try and get 50% of the deposit back? Yeah, yeah, right. And this is why customers are so suspicious and they're so prickly and they get easily outraged because trust between companies and customers is at an all-time low. Trust in 2011 is an all-time low, worldwide, at least in the Western world. That's a very easy fact for me to remember, 
because in 2010, trust between customers and companies was at an all-time low. 2009, it was at an all-time low. Every year, it gets worse and worse and worse. You know, and when you see ads on TV, when Telecom or Vodafone tell you that they're better than the other, do you think, well, that must be true, I'll switch. You know, we're probably wrong, you know, go with it. No, you think, yeah, right, pull the other leg, mate, she's got bells on it, you know. They just don't believe. So we want to be putting the customer first. I'm saying to you, you look at your processes, you look at your policies, you look at how people behave in your business, and look at yourself and see whether you're putting your customer first. And the last one I want to cover is this. If you really want to be ahead next year, put your customers not just first, but in the center of your world and learn as much as you can about them and use that information to change the way you run your business. Here's my challenge for you. My challenge is that every month from here on in, you can put your finger on a change that you have made in your business so that your business in some way runs better in the next month than it did this month because of the change you've made and you've made this change because you learned in the preceding month that if you made this change then your customers would think that you were a better company or person to do business with. So on September the 17th, if I run into you on the street, I want you to say, Brooksy, let me tell you about this change we've made because after I saw you in August, I went out and talked to my customers, I listened to my customers, I found out that if we did this, then it would be better for them and we've implemented that change. And imagine if you did that every month, it doesn't have to be a big change. But if your competition stays where they are and every month you make a change, you're just moving further and further and further away from them. And at some point, your customers or prospective customers won't be able to see you and your competitors without turning their head. Their peripheral vision is just simply not that great. And at that point, they won't see you as being better. They will see you as being different. And as I said, that's where you get the competitive advantage. You've got to aim to be different. So. You're saying to me, well, gosh, how am I going to think of all of this stuff, you know? And the good news is, I've learned this in being in business for 35 years, your customers will tell you everything you need to know to succeed. In fact, they're telling you every day, we just don't listen. Compliments. What happens when a customer gives you a compliment? Oh, that sucks, mate. You know? We don't, certainly don't blow our horn about it and we don't analyze it and look at what we can learn. I've got a client that is very customer driven. We've just done some work that has given them 400 comments from customers and the CEO phoned me up and he said, you know, I had a quick look at those comments and he said, most of them are really positive. This is so exciting. Well, I've just been analyzing those comments. Two thirds of them are positive, one third are negative overwhelmingly in the positive comments people talk, this is a retail environment, about team members, staff members being friendly and helpful. He hasn't taken it to that next step, but I'm seeing them next week. All of the store managers in Australia were having a big meeting and I'm going to tell them those results because they can then go out and say to their teams, hey guys, one thing really matters to customers, be friendly and helpful. So whatever else we do, make that your number one goal. You know, let's get that smile on. Let's, let's greet that person. Let's let them know that we'll do anything that we possibly can to, to make it easier for them to, to buy or, or get the solution that they're looking for. What are your customers complimenting you about that you think, oh, thanks, mate, that's really nice to hear and not taking it the next step further and saying, what can we learn about this? Because it's not just what we're doing well, it's what matters to our customers. We don't compliment people on things that don't matter to us. Complaints. Whoa, get away. You know, we constantly think, get a complaint, let's defend ourselves. Smart ones among you will say, no, 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 let's deal with this complaint. It's a great chance to rescue this customer. Yeah, but it's also a great chance to identify a problem and fix it and so that it doesn't happen again. You know, do you have a log of complaints? Do you sit down and look at that log and think, isn't that interesting? You know, in the last three months, here's a complaint that come up more than others. This is what we need to fix. One third of the negative of the comments that this store had, this company had, retail company, were negative. Overwhelmingly, the negative comments are about the stores being too crowded. Aisles are too narrow and whatever. I mean, just 
You pay money for market research to find out what these customers are telling you freely every day. What are your customers telling you that you're not hearing, not analyzing, not acting on? Compliments, complaints, suggestions, questions. Questions people ask, frequently asked questions, tell us there's a need that's not met. Maybe we think we're meeting it, maybe we didn't even think there was a need there. I did seminars like this, one day seminars for the, chairman, uh, for the general managers of five star hotels in Dubai. Over lunch a guy said to me, he said, Brooksy, it's really easy to be positive and enthusiastic to the first person who comes up and says, excuse me, what time does the shuttle go to the airport this afternoon? He said, but by the 86th person, mate, she's wearing a bit thin. I said, if 86 people are asking you what time the shuttle goes to the airport, what does that tell you? He said, well, we have a sign on the wall. Well, I guess it ain't working, right? Listen to your customers, do something about it, and life would be a lot easier for them and for you. So, have, put some systems in place. Open your minds and listen to your customers and find out what they are telling you that you can use to improve your business. Why would you want to do that? Because you will change, your competitor won't, people will see you as different and they will start to move from being a customer into a believer. And all of the irritants will go and the positive things will be done in a more widespread way. So the market is tough. No doubt about it. In fact, you know, I think business is tough, generally speaking. I have all my life. But it ain't complicated. And there's really only one simple rule that we need to live by. And it's this, that each and every one of us, each and every minute, of each and every single day, ought to treat our customers as if our future depended on it. Because it does. Thank you very much.